Uh, so we're very grateful uh, that Dr. John Piacentini is presenting the webinar today. Dr. Piacentini is a board certified clinical child and adolescent psychologist and professor in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. He directs the UCLA Child OCD, Anxiety and Tick Disorders Clinic and Tourette Association Center for Excellence, which provide diagnostic evaluation and treatment for youth with these problems. Uh, he also directs the UCLA Center for Child Anxiety Resilience, Education and Support, which provides education and programming to parents, teachers and clinicians about anxiety prevention and management. I, I, I hand it over to you, Dr. Piacentini. Great. Thank you, Jillian. It's uh, really nice to be here uh, today. Um, let, me, um, let me screen share here. I don't think that'll be a problem. Here we go. And uh, can everyone see this? Yes. Did it come up yet? Okay, great. Yep, that's fine. Okay, good. So um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, body focused repetitive behaviors, which, as you all know, are, are trichotillomania and skin picking. You know, with the advent of um, skin picking uh, entering the DSM 5, uh, we've broadened it a bit. They're pretty similar in terms of treatment and phenomenology, but um, there are some subtle differences that I'm also going to, to try to um, uh, discuss as well. Let me get that box off. Okay, great. So um, my disclosures, I don't have anything relevant here. Um, I do receive research support from the TLC Foundation for BFRBs. And I'm gonna be talking about some research that we've done with this group, some clinical research. Um, TLC Foundation, for those of you that aren't aware, is uh, the leading uh, support organization for pickers and pullers, probably in the world, and it's a great resource for patients as well. So I have a little bit of information about that as well that I think might be helpful for you. So today we're going to talk about the defining features and clinical correlates of BFRBs, uh, body-focused repetitive behaviors, um, talk about treatment approaches, and again, um, uh, talk about resources. So um, BFRBs, as with everything in our field, those of you that you work with Tourette's and OCD and ASD and BFRBs, um, we, love, we love acronyms. Uh, Body-focused repetitive behaviors are the behaviors of pulling and picking. Body-focused repetitive behavior disorders are the disorders um, most prominently skin picking and Tourette's. But BFRBs are repetitive self-grooming behaviors directed towards a part of one's body. Um, you know, for oftentimes we're looking for a certain uh, level of um, activity in terms of pulling or picking rates uh, to make a, a diagnosis. DSM doesn't really require diagnostic um, uh, duration of illness, but um, it's important to try to assess this. And, you know, something that's going to cause physical damage or, or impairment. And there are a number of body focused repetitive behaviors beyond trick and beyond skin picking that are really treated the same way. And these would include nail biting, nose picking, cheaper lip biting. Some even include um, cracking, knuckle cracking as well in this. So for DSM-5 trichotillomania, um, you know, it's a recurrent attempt to pull one's hair out. Uh, we need to see noticeable hair loss to make the diagnosis. Um, the individuals try but are unable to decrease or stop their hair pulling. We're looking for um, this symptom can't be better explained by the symptoms of another disorder, for example, body dysmorphic disorder or a medical condition. And we're, we need to have impairment or distress. And when we're thinking about TTM in terms of there's a lot of uh, potential um, differentials that we want to look at, some people um, you know, remove hair for cosmetic or grooming purposes. Some twist their hair or bite their hair. Um, that's similar, but it's not considered trichotillomania. If it's, uh, and again, for BDD, we, we don't wanna do that, or we wanna differentiate it from OCD, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then there are medical conditions like alopecia that need to be ruled out as well. Skin picking is pretty similar. Skin picking, scratching, digging, or rubbing resulting in skin lesions that need again to be noticeable. Um, difficulties decreasing or stopping the behavior causes clinically significant distress or impairment, and it can't be attributed to a physiologic or another medical condition. Um, and uh, we also want to see some impairment here as, as well. So differential for skin picking can be a little bit trickier. Um, body dysmorphic disorder is uh, we commonly see picking or digging around the face or other areas of the body. But in body dysmorphic disorder, 
the the picking or or scraping or whatever it might be really is uh, engaged in to remove or minimize a perceived defect. So the individual thinks that there's there's a physical flaw somewhere on their person on their face, and the and the picking in body dysmorphic is an attempt to correct that flaw and make that flaw flaw go away. Um, in BDD, people pick for different reasons, either sensory or, or emotional. Um, uh, habituation or for because they find it quite pleasurable. But there's a fair amount of overlap and somebody can have both. I had a patient that um, picked her face because of body dysmorphic because of defects and she picked hairs on her arm because that was satisfying to her. So you can have both. And again, for somebody that is engaged in self injurious behaviors or self harm, we're not going to count that. Um, again, OCD, we're not going to count that. And the big thing that's an issue with teens is acne. When does picking acne um, stop just being picking acne and move into skin picking disorder? And that, that can be kind of a differential um, diagnosis as well. So these disorders are actually quite common. For trichotillomania, we think up to one to 5%. We don't have good prevalence data, um, although I'll talk about it in a minute. There is some data, but there may be some questions about it. Excoriation disorder or skin picking is up to 4%, and we think that's probably more common than, than trichotillomania. Uh, the gender ratios are a little bit different in kids. Trich is about 50-50. Uh, once we get into adulthood, um, we see about 90% female, just from clinical samples and prior surveys. But there was a study recently by John Grant, Darren Doherty, and colleagues of, I think, over close to 20,000 individuals and they found actually that the prevalence rates for males and females were almost identical. 1.8% for males, 1.7% for females, which raises some real serious questions about why these findings are so different from everything else that we've seen clinically and otherwise. Um, and there are a couple of questions about that study. It wasn't necessarily a representative sample and um, it may be that maybe there are more male pickers out there or pullers out there that just don't come in for treatment. And uh, so it, there is, are some questions about gender ratio. And skin picking is also predominantly female, about 80%. Um, onset age, both of these are can be early age uh, onsets. Trick we just roughly around 12 um, is probably the, the modal onset age, although it can start as early as six months of age, and it also can start in later, later life as well. Excoriation disorder may start a little bit later, maybe around age 15. And with regard to this early onset um, trick and, and, and picking as well, we call it baby trick. And that, that, that we see this in babies. And it really is, is oftentimes associated with thumb sucking. Um, and it's, a self, it's really a self-soothing behavior that, that very young children fall into it and, and engage in, it can be pretty dramatic. I mean, kid, the little babies can pull all their hair out, which is really distressing to parents, but it's typically self-limiting. And when the, the thumb sucking goes away, oftentimes so does the picking or pulling uh, behaviors. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about hair pulling, about BFRBs. Um, they have been around forever. Um, these are very old. Uh, behaviors. They're evolutionarily conserved behaviors. It really is grooming, um, you know, it gone awry. We see this in animals as well. Um, people who engage in BFRBs are very anxious. Well, some are, but that doesn't drive this in, in all. This is not just a, an external sign of an underlying anxiety disorder. Nor are hair pulling and skin picking signs of underlying serious psychopathology like psychosis or self-harm. Um, or self-mutilation, or are they signs of stress or abuse? Again, oftentimes people pull or pick to manage unwanted sensations or unwanted emotions, but um, that, that doesn't mean that they were necessarily his use histories. It's really stopped just by stop doing that. Don't do it anymore. These are pretty, pretty ingrained um, behaviors that, that can be treated. We have good treatments for them, but it can be uh, take a lot of work to treat them. And then the other thing that most people think of are BFRBs are just another form of OCD because they're in, now they've been moved from an impulse control disorder in DSM-4 to um, an OCD and related disorder section in DSM-5. 
they have a lot of overlap with OCD and with Tourette's. I actually think they resemble Tourette's more than OCD, um, but, but they go beyond that. How do we discriminate OCD and BFRBs? Well, in OCD, we have obsessions present. There are no obsessions in BFRBs. Um, BFRBs aren't um, engaged in, people don't pick or pull to avoid harm the way somebody with OCD might engage in a protective ritual. BFRBs oftentimes are gratifying, that they, they derive pleasure. You can derive pleasure from picking or pulling, which is very different from OCD, which uh, of compulsions are really engaged in terms of escaping or reducing distress. Uh, more females than males in BFRBs, not in OCD. Earlier age of onset typically, although again, it's highly variable. BFRBs don't respond that well to SSRIs or other medications we typically use for OCD. And for BFRBs, as we'll talk about, we're really looking more at function-based treatments rather than exposure-based treatments. And finally, BFRBs tend to be egocentronic. A lot of the patients that we work with, they don't like the distress and functional impairments associated with the pulling and the picking, but they do like the pulling and the picking. And this is a bit different from OCD. But similar to OCD, similar to tics, when we think about tics and an urge, engaging in the tic and relief from the urge, or OCD, um, experiencing an obsession, engaging in a ritual, which makes that obsessive anxiety go away, we do find the same thing in trichotillomania in skin picking. There's some kind of an urge, stress, anxiety, tension. The picking or the pulling can lead either to relief from these negative feelings, um, gratification, um, in some ways, just, just a, sense of, a sense of reducing these, these unwanted feelings, or indeed pleasure. It can actually be a pleasurable, pleasurable activity. So when we're thinking about pulling, there are a couple of, of and, and picking as well, although there, there's a lot more research on trichotillomania than there is on skin picking. So um, most of what I'm gonna be talking about does focus on pulling, although we think a lot of this is applicable across um, all BFRBs. So when we think about pulling behaviors, we used to think of automatic pulling versus focused pulling. That was some of the early, rating scales um, and factor analyses identified that some people pull automatically, they're just pulling without even knowing that they're pulling. And others are really focused when they're pulling, they're really focused on the behaviors. Um, that that um, dichotomy hasn't really held up so well. And um, more recent research suggests that a better way of describing these pulling types of pulling are um, intentional pulling that I'm aware of the urge and I'm pulling, I'm not really triggered by an emotional state. I'm really just engaged in pulling because potentially I like to pull. And then emotional pulling, and this is pulling triggered by an emotional state. And the pulling is really engaged in, in achieving some kind of homeostasis or making a bad feeling or bad sensations, bad thoughts go away. So this is really, the pulling is therapy is trying to, um, to, to feel better, make something bad go away. And emotional pulling can be um, within consciousness or actually the patients may not be aware that they're pulling. And most pullers engage in both types of pulling depending on the circumstance. So when we're doing our treatment, we want to um, really be careful to understand which episodes might be more emotional and which episodes might be more intentional because as you would imagine, the treatment approaches are different for these two types of pulling. So what are some of the characteristic features of intentional pulling? Um, oftentimes there's a searching process, rubbing fingers over skin, over air, over the eyebrows to find irregularities to focus on, looking for the right hair to pull, looking for the right scab to pick. And afterwards, it's pretty common for pullers to play with the hair, to manipulate the hair in some way, rubbing, rubbing it on their lips or their mouth or their skin, uh, chewing the hair, swallowing the hair, oftentimes pulling, um, biting off the, root, the um, root of the hair, sometimes swallowing the whole hair, uh, smelling the hair, and the same thing with scabs and skin, can be playing with it, looking at it, chewing it, swallowing it. The other thing that's pretty common is pulling by proxy. So about a third of um, uh, 
prickers and about 20% of skin pickers report pulling hair from family members, from spouses, from friends. Kids pull from their parents, from their pets, from dolls, from carpet, from anything to get this sensation. And we've had a number of patients that pull from their pets and, and some of them actually pull the whiskers from their pets, which can be very painful for the pets. Um, a number of tools are used to facilitate the pulling and the picking. So for pulling fingers, tweezers, combs and brushes, um, pencils. So you might wrap your hair around a pencil and pull it out. A lot of mirror gazing, looking in the mirror and using that to pull. Um, we see some of these kids carrying around shiny objects like um, little mirrors with them so that they can see what they're doing, especially for picking, more so for picking. And for picking it, some of the same things, fingernails, tweezers, knives, pins, and then mirrors to get those spots on the back of the head or to really be precise in terms of, of picking. And this is, uh, the, you know, using mirrors and things like this can be very similar to BDD, body dysmorphic, of trying to find that right, right scab to pick. But again, picking in, in skin picking is done um, for pleasure or to relieve a negative emotional state rather than a perceived body flaw. So picking can occur almost anywhere, but we find a lot of the kids that, that we work with tend to do it, um, and adults, um, when they're alone in sedentary activities because they have the time to focus. So lying in bed at night is one of the biggest places that we see. And oftentimes that might simply be a function of privacy, especially for the kids and the teens that we work with. Um, at night, you know, they settle into bed and you know, all their thoughts are, are racing and they may be reflecting on the day. They may be worrying about what's going to be happening tomorrow in school or socially or with family. That leads to anxiety and it's an optimal time to pick. Others um, may be uh, less, um, less intentional or emotional pulling or, you know, really unconscious pulling, reading, driving, talking on the phone, watching TV. Um, it's just something to pass to pass the time. Less frequently is during active times. We see less pulling and picking when people are engaged in something like walking or um, engaging in conversations or different kinds of social situations. Um, the behaviors are sometimes triggered by sensations, as, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, itching, tingling, maybe pain in a certain region. region. And that brings up the question of a higher pain threshold. If you've ever picked a scab or pulled a hair, it hurts. And um, triggers and pullers oftentimes don't report so much that it, that it hurts. And it may be that they're just sensitized over time or desensitized over time, or there may be even a higher pain threshold. And there's been a little bit of work here with mixed findings, but um, it may parallel some work that we see with um, NSSIs um, like cutting, for example, or um, that, that where there does seem to be pain seems to be less of an issue in these sensations. It, maybe it's related to just an over-focus on the behavior or something else. Um, and then others, um, and as I said, some report no sensations prior to picking or pulling. They just do it even, you know, just out of, out of doing it out of consciousness, not even aware of it, or because they're really focused on some other kind of internal state that's driving the behavior. So a lot of what we know about trichotillomania phenomenology came from two studies that were funded by the Trichotillomania Learning Center, the TLC Foundation. And uh, we, um, when a group of, of researchers went to NIMH to understand why we, um, they weren't funding any research on trichotillomania, and the NIMH basically said, well, we don't know how many people have it and we don't think it's that important and the people just pull their hair. Bring us some data telling us why we need to fund this. So the TLC Foundation launched two online surveys. Uh, the first was the TRIC uh, Impact Project or TIP Adult um, who recruited 1,697 participants online, age 18 to 69, 93% female. And the TIP C, recruited 133 youth and parents, again, through um, an, an online survey. These were kids aged 10 to 17, also 86% female. And um, it really, um, really broadened our understanding of the phenomenology here. Even though these data are, are you know, over 10 years old, they're still quite relevant. You can see scalp and eyebrows are the most common picking sites 
in adults and kids. Eyelashes, very common in adults, relatively common in kids. And then pubic, leg, arms, a little bit less common in kids because not all kids may have hair on these places while they're, they're pulling. And kids report are less, less prone to pull from one area. They tend to pull from a lot of different areas, uh, maybe relative to adults. But scalp and eyebrows are really the most common. They're also the most accessible. What about adults? What drives the pulling? Um, and these are, um, the, the survey was, you know, in 10%, in you know, zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, which is why you see these greater than and, and range signs. Not over 90% describe some anxiety after pulling. Even though it may be gratifying or pleasurable, it still is, um, there still is some anxiety or distress about this. Uh, most report some unpleasant urge prior to pulling or some bodily sensation. Um, in some cases, the urge increases when they're resisting, not always. Um, most know that they're aware of pulling at least sometimes, and some pull to achieve a certain bodily sensation um, as, as well. And again, that's a little bit more mixed. Adults also described um, how do they manage the urge to pull? And these are a lot of ways that aren't very helpful. Um, 15% reported smoking to reduce the urge, 14% drink. Um, um, drink, uh, this is 8%, sorry, this is a, that's a typo there. Um, other substances in some. And 70% of the people that responded to this survey believe that pulling led to the development of an additional emotional disorder. And as we'll see in a minute, we know that anxiety and depression are quite common. Now this is a self-selected sample, so it may not be representative, but it's a pretty large sample. So there, there likely is some, some merit to these findings. Anxiety and depression, we compared um, reported anxiety and depression rates in um, individuals with uh, trichotillomania compared to OCDs and healthy controls by combining data from a couple of studies. And you can see depression, anxiety, and stress were as high, if not a little bit higher in the pullers than in individuals with OCD and certainly higher than baseline rates in the community. So we do, we do see a lot of comorbid comorbidity in that sense. Again, whether the anxiety and depression are secondary to pulling or um, independent of pulling, it's not, it's not as clear at this point. What about kids? Pulling severity, pretty similar to the adults. However, much less likely to experience tension or relief after pulling. So kids tend to, um, tend to pull, um, and only 4% said they were never or almost never aware of pulling. So kids may pull more intentionally. Kids may really be pulling and be aware of their pulling and pulling for um, um, different, different reasons. And rather than, rather than pulling to manage unwanted um, feelings or sensations or urges, and if, you, if you've worked with kids, this makes some sense. A lot of times the kids may pull when they're stressed, but a lot of kids just pull. This is the habit really, in some cases without meaning. And over time, what we see is that the meaning of the pulling or the pulling may become related to um, negative emotions or negative sensations. And the pulling can over time become more emotionally driven. And we see this with Tourette's a little bit too, I think. Um, some of our, our theories are working with really young kids. K young kids may have urges. Um, they may tick, but they don't really notice the ticks as much. And ticks may not be a big idea to them. But it's really after feedback or after some of the negative responses or reactions or sequelae of ticks start becoming more apparent, the ticks develop more of a negative connotation. And they can start leading to more problems. So this may be an evolution of just a grooming behavior gone a little haywire in kids to over time becoming associated with more psychological or psychiatric symptomatology. Again, perhaps through environmental or other, other um, um, interactions. And another thing you can see here is that when we look at the kids in the tip C and the trick impact for kids, Mood and anxiety comorbidity was pretty rare in younger kids. Now this may reflect that mood symptoms, we do see fewer mood symptoms in younger kids than we do in older kids, but we do see anxiety pretty commonly across the age span. Between 10 to 13, less than 20% of kids reported difficulty. 
by ages 14 to 17, the mood and anxiety rates went, went in much higher. So this is cross-sectional data, but I think it's reasonably safe to assume that for younger kids with um, pulling, the longer they pull, the more likely they are to develop more problematic mood and anxiety symptoms. Again, whether this is a function of their pulling or whether it's just uh, a maturation uh, need, and the mood and anxiety would have increased anyway, it's not really clear, but we do need to think about how we're going to address mood and anxiety when we're working with, with both kids and adults with, with strict. It has to be part of the screening. Common picking sites um, in skin picking, I mean, or what you would imagine, where you can reach, face, scalp, arms, legs, and chests. And dermatologists have described a butterfly pattern for when they see skin picking uh, for people on their backs. And, and what this is, you can only pick what you can reach. So you can see scabs around the shoulders and maybe around the lower back, but right in the middle of the back, there are no lesions and it's a diagnostic sign for whether, whether some of the lesions that we might see actually are related to skin picking or another skin disorder. Um, I alluded to earlier that, that we're, TLC has funded a project called the BFRB Precision Medicine Initiative. And this was funded through TLC Foundation donors. There's no public money for this. And the overall aim of this, this initiative is to um, develop precision treatments targeting individual characteristics or profiles of pulling and picking. So we know that, that pulling and picking are quite heterogeneous. People pull intentionally, emotionally, they pull be to, to, because they like pulling, they pull to make bad feelings go away, they pull because of a sense of relief. Um, and our treatments are really kind of, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everybody looks like a nail, so everybody gets a hammer. We haven't been, we don't understand pulling and picking well enough to be able to really tailor, tailor treatments precisely. So, um, and these were three sites, Chicago, UCLA, and Mass General. And we recruited 364 individuals with trick skin picking and healthy controls, including 53 youth. And it's the largest BFRB study um, conducted to date. And all of these, all of these um, research participants went through uh, a very lengthy behavioral clinical interview, comorbidity, picking characteristics. We looked at sensory factors, um, impulsivity, emotion regulation, body image, a um, whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we collected blood for genetic analysis. We did neurocognitive, computerized, and paper and pencil tasks. And we did imaging. Um, both structural and functional imaging and resting state and DTI. And the idea is we, we developed behavioral profiles of, of patients. So which kind, what kind of characteristics stuck together that would lead to some distinct subtypes. And now we're just looking at our imaging data to see if we can validate these subtypes using our imaging and genetics data. And if so, if we can come up with some biologically distinct behaviorally, biologically distinct subtypes, also based on different kinds of pulling and picking characteristics, we can tailor treatments, both, both medical treatments, maybe, maybe computerized treatments, um, as well as behavioral treatments to meet the specific needs of these different patients. For example, looking at different patterns of sensory, um, sensory factors, emotion regulation, impulsivity, perhaps genetics, um, reward sensitivity, putting all these together. And that's that's the, the goal here. We've just started looking at these data, but we have um, identified uh, three trichotillomania subtypes from these data based on the behavioral data. And the first is more of a sensory sensitive subtype. And these are focused pullers or really intentional pullers. They know that they're pulling. It's a very, you know, they're doing it in a, in a, in a, in a very um, predictable format, stereotyped format. Um, the urges are relatively low intensity. So they're pulling because they just, they, they like to pull or there's some kind of a sensory factor with this. There isn't any ne necessarily negative emotion attached. The low awareness is the largest group. And this is what we think more traditionally about pullers. These are the automatic pullers, the emotionally triggered pullers. Um, and they just pull without really knowing about it. They tend to be more impulsive and also have lower urges. And um, 
this is the person that sits down to read a book and they get up an hour later and their lap is covered with hair and they don't really know where the hair came from. Um, and then the third group is more of an impulsive perfectionistic pulling group. And this is the group that really pulls to control unpleasant urges. So these are the ones that are distressed, they have higher mood and anxiety, perfectionism, they're more impulsive, poorer distress tolerance, and they pull, they can't resist pulling, they have urges, they have bad feelings, their, their behavior is really driven um, and they can't resist it because they're really pulling to make, to feel better. Unlike the sensory, which they're just kind of pulling because they like the way it feels and the low awareness, they're just pulling and they don't even know they're pulling. So you can see here how they're different. This might drive different treatment approaches that we'll talk about in a minute. And for skin pickers, we found two subtypes. The skin picking subtyping wasn't quite as, the, the groups weren't quite as interesting. Um, the, the largest group was more of an emotional reward picking group strong and frequent urges. They had both automatic pulling and negative emotion um, triggered picking, excuse me, picking, little control, um, ADHD and perfectionism. So these were, the, these were the pickers, most of the pickers pull to control negative emotions or to pull distress. We see fewer automatic, automatic pickers. And that, that makes some sense because if I'm gonna pull my hair, I can just pull. If I'm picking, I really need to find something to pick. I need to find a spot to pick. It takes a little more focus, a little more concentration rather than just yank. So, um, and then the second group was really more, what we call it a functional group, really milder symptoms, lower urges, a little bit of sensory issues, but, but not much distress. So this really, it almost seems like it's more severe subtype and more of a mild subtype. So these are, these are um, some of the subtypes that we're starting to think now and looking at the, the, um, some of the other data here to see how we can use this to really develop maybe some better treatments. And what we found, um, we did some, our first imaging papers are just starting to come out. And we found when we look at the, um, the um, structural imaging across these three groups, we find that the low awareness pullers have increased cortical volume um, in certain areas versus the, the higher awareness. In areas related to touch proprioception, uh, touch proprioception related sensory activation. So that there may be um, related to different sensory or sensitivities or the feelings or where, where our hands are in, in space, knowing where different parts of our body are in space and how that relates to sensory activation. So that might argue for, um, for maybe some more kinesthetic treatments for this or sensory related treatments. But again, extremely preliminary at this point. And we found the impulsive perfectionistic pullers um, had some decreased volume in other areas, uh, brain areas compared to controls and areas associated with response inhibition in the context of negative emotions. So it may be that this group, there's actually some biological substrate for the inability to tolerate or manage negative emotions. So when I'm in these different situations, I need to do something to feel better. And um, they may not have the, the, the be able to regulate biologically these negative feelings. So again, there's some potentially clear treatment um, recommendations from this as well. Um, and then the other study from this area, we looked at reward processing. And this was just looking at the BFRB, the pickers and the pullers collectively versus the healthy controls. And this was a, a money task where you need to decide how much money you wanna risk in terms of how much money you wanna gain. And we found that the BFRB group um, had increased brain activation in a number of areas during anticipation of loss when they thought they were gonna lose money in these tasks, they had much higher activation. And it may be that again, people with BFRBs um, may have overactivity or maybe they maybe biologically overreact to anticipations of rewards or punishments, which, which it, it's more of, they're more of an emotional reaction to different types of, of settings where there might be stress, which interferes with their ability to control top down. So cognitively, we can control our behaviors, but if I'm in a heightened era, uh, time of stress, then I might react more impulsively, and that might be pulling or picking to manage stress rather than trying to manage through in another way. 
Now, this is cross-sectional data, so it may be that these brain areas are sequelae of a history of pulling and picking rather than underlying um, targets. But um, it is kind of exciting here to think about we're able to start subtyping and looking at these behaviors on multiple levels. Um, the genetic data is to come, and we're hoping we can actually put something together to really uh, drive treatment in these areas. Um, so we have these subtypes. Let's get back um, to looking at some of the consequences of pulling and picking. And again, um, if you've worked with these patients, you've probably seen this, you know, baldness, hair loss. A lot of times there's scarring from the pulling or picking and the hair may not grow back um, if there's scarring or damage to the scalp or certainly scarring on the face or other areas where you're picking. Repetitive strain, people have um, wrist and, and hand um, injuries, calluses on fingers, dental impacts at times from actually chewing on the hairs and biting the hairs, and trichobezoars or hairballs. We find from people that, um, that swallow their hair. And I had a couple of pictures of trichobezoars that I decided not to show because they're pretty gross, but some of these can get very big. Some of these can, can be the size of, um, you know, can be, can weigh, you know, weigh multiple pounds and they're impacting, they can impact the intestine or the digestive system. And in, and in severe cases, they can lead to death. Um, we had a five-year-old, four-year-old girl in clinic who actually had to have surgical removal of a trichobezoar, a hairball from pulling her in eating her hair. And they referred her to us for treatment because they're very concerned that if she developed another trichobezoar that they, it may lead to really serious complications. So that is something that we need to, we need to think about in these patients. Financial costs as well, um, wigs, makeup, prosthetics, laser, treat, laser treatments. Um, a lot of our trick patients um, get very tight hair weaves um, that are put in. And what, what that happens is they can, um, the, 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 the weaves, the artificial hair is, is weaved in with their regular hair. It's done so tightly that they can't pull it. And it may take them several weeks or even a month or longer to actually un, uh, lessen the tightness of the hair to the point that they can pull it. And a lot of the pulling they're doing is going to be from, from the wig. So by the time the wig is almost gone, they've still protected their hair and they go in and they can get a new, a new um, weave, but these things can be quite expensive. Um, uh, time spent pulling and picking, we people miss, you know, they miss work, they miss education. Um, a lot of, we've had people that have dropped out of school or quit their jobs because it's just too embarrassing. The, um, they spend so much time engaged in pulling and picking hours and hours on end in some cases. Um, and you can see social opportunities. If you see a patient come into your office in the middle of the summer wearing a hat and a long sleeve shirt, um, that's one of the first questions that we wanna ask. If, we're, if I'm at a swimming pool, I'm at an outdoor party at the beach and somebody's like wearing sleeves and a hat, you, um, it, it's a possibility that there may be something going on with the, with the BFRB. I, not, I don't have time to talk too much about assessment measures, but um, the TLSA Foundation website has a full page with almost all of the measures that we use. Um, you can download for free. Some are even translated into different languages. And these are clinical scales that you can use as a clinician, interviews. Um, these are severity scales, and they're also child and parent and child and adult self-reports. So there's a QR code here. All you know how to do is uh, flash your camera to the screen and take screen and take a picture of that, and that will give you the link to this to this website. Um, and there there are a number of measures that we use here that I think can be really helpful in clinical practice. So let's talk about treatment. What does treatment typically look like? Well, treatment is typically a combination of different approaches um, and ideally tailored to the specific needs of the patient, although that doesn't always happen. So we're gonna look at a behavioral approaches derived from habit reversal therapy, HRT, um, as the Tourette, Net Tourette Network members, I assume you guys are pretty familiar with HRT. Also functional analysis, um, which are the two components of CBIT. Treatment's pretty similar to what we might do with Tourette's, although with some, with some um, differences, but the core techniques are relatively similar. And then for effective emotional pulling, where we do see a lot of difficulty tolerating or managing distress, we're going to do treatments for anxiety or de de uh, depression as indicated, or third wave interventions to try to um, enhance 
um, emotion regulation and distress tolerance. So things like dialectical behavior therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy. For younger kids, it's more behavioral as you might expect and parental involvement is um, always necessary for youth treatment. But the primary thing we wanna teach the patients is to, is to not get involved with their kids' hair pulling, to not respond to the kids' hair pulling. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, minute as well. The thing that's different about treating trichotillomania in skin picking from OCD and Tourette's is that BFRBs can be pleasurable. People like this. And this is a quote from a young girl. Um, I occasionally go into a trance on my legs where I can spend hours and hours just sitting on the counter, plucking and picking. Chewing is a big part. I like the, the thicker hairs, part of the ritual and lashes. Not a day goes by that I don't imagine what it would feel like just to start pulling every hair out of my head. I feel that pulling is addicting and the monster tells me that it would feel so good and I would be so relaxed afterwards and it would make all my troubles go away. Have any of you ever heard one of your tick patients describe a tick in that way or an OCD behavior in that way? We don't. So that, that's the rub. That's the difference between, between treating trick and these other disorders. And in this sense, you know, trichotillomania is considered in, is in the OCD and related disorder section. But really, trick is probably closer to an addictive disorder. And if you think about it, you know, the, the focused, you know, the focused pulling where I'm just sitting at the table with my bottle or my or my my fingers or my tweezers, or I'm just drinking and I don't even know. I come home and I just go and I just grab grab a beer and I start drinking and I'm not even aware necessarily of what I'm doing. I just want to deaden my deaden my my distress or my pain. That that sounds a little more like trick. And so when we're doing the treatments, we need to really focus on this. It's not enough, you know. And when we're when we're working with our OCD and, and Tourette patients, you know, and they're engaging in competing response or they're engaging in in other type exposure. And they're able to 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 um, to reduce the, the the ticks or the compulsions. They feel good about that. Pullers and pickers don't always feel so good about that. So that that's the issue. How well do treatments work? Well, if we think about behavioral treatments, HRT um, based treatments, they work pretty well in research. That's a that's a big effect size. And what mood enhanced means is that HRT when it's combined with something like um, ACT or DBT or another kind of distress um, management or anxiety depression management interventions, it tends to work better than just doing HRT only. Again, because we need to get at these, these broader, the broader phenomenology. Medications, um, the SSRIs, eh, not so, don't work so well. Um, really, we use medications in our program and people use medications to treat the comorbid depression and anxiety. And you know, it's almost a piece of the functional analysis. The same thing if you're looking at um, Tourette's and, and we see that stress or anxiety is driving ticks, then we want to address the stress or anxiety. And there is a lot of data now looking at nutraceuticals. So N-acetylcysteine is, there's been a couple of studies suggesting about a 50% response rate for both hair pulling and maybe roughly similar for skin picking in adults, not in kids. It doesn't work as well in kids, maybe, maybe teens. So a lot of people, a lot of people are using N-acetylcysteine. It's really safe. It's pretty easy to use um, as an adjunct to behavioral treatment. And I think that's recommended. Uh, most people in the TREC community and the BFRB community would recommend that. But we don't have a lot of data. It really is just, just a couple of, of studies here for that. So when we're thinking about the different treatment approaches, the function-based approach is, is something that where we want to really start with to drive our treatment decisions. And we use obviously an ABC model, the antecedents or triggers, the behaviors, and the consequences. We know that pulling or picking serves a function for the individual. And we need to understand what that function is, what the patient is getting out of the behavior in order to treat it. Is it, is it to reduce unwanted or distressing thoughts, feelings, behaviors? Is it to achieve a sense of relief? Is it gratification? Is it pleasure? What, what is it? So we need to evaluate the different areas of the individual's experience, including both external and external cues and triggers, 
so we can then identify um, we can identify how to address each of these each of these different factors because we need to understand how the behavior manifests um, if we want to try to um, help the patient uh, stop doing it. Habit reversal training is um, again probably the key component of almost every intervention and uh, probably many of you know about habit reversal training. It's a behavioral approach. The first step is awareness training, helping the patients become aware of the urge or the triggers to pick or pull, um, whatever those might be, good, bad, or, or indifferent. We want to increase awareness of the triggers to pull or pick, um, especially for people that pull or pick um, you know, without really doing it, it's pulling or picking out of their own consciousness. Once they're able to recognize it, David, that they're triggering, that they're about to pull or pick, we teach them a competing response, something to do instead. And that might be, again, the, the basic prototypic competing response is making a fist. You can't pull if you're making a fist, but it may also be playing with something um, or um, engaging, engaging in some other kind of a behavior with the hand. And this is, um, relates to stimulus control. So there are things that we can do with kids or adults. We can have them wear heavy bracelets or jangly bracelets. So when they move their arm, the proprioception or where their arm is in space is different than it, what, it is, what they're used to. And that breaks them out of this, out of this that, that leads to more awareness of their arm moving um, or the noise as well. Um, Kids with, um, with pulling or picking, we give them, um, um, they always have something in their hand to do. So we're gonna give them koosh balls, squeeze balls, Play-Doh, nails, wearing gloves um, at home at night, wearing Band-Aids over their fingers. Anything we can do to try to um, uh, raise awareness and make it more difficult to pull, to really get at this automatic behavior that they're doing. Um, and then we're going to use social support and relaxation training or other kind of adjunct to help them deal with their, their other issues. So when we want to really address the different, you know, kind of functional components, uh, the treatment developed by Charlie Mansueto and his colleagues about 20 years ago, the Comprehensive Behavioral Treatment, or the COMB, um, COMB, it's a great, great acronym for this, is really designed to build awareness of triggers and consequences of picking or pulling and identify interventions again and implement these interventions. And there are two books here, the Overcoming BFRBs book with the orange leaves just came out. It's a very nice guide to this treatment. And then the Hair Pulling in You is a book we use in clinic for kids. Um, it's a self-guide, but we really use it as a therapist guide and it's very good. And I'll show you what these both look like. So the idea is for the functional intervention is to identify the domains that we want to look at that we think are going to be important to address. And COMB uses um, the, this acronym to, they, they focus on sensory factors, the sensory and tactile needs or triggers, the cognitive factors or their automatic thoughts or beliefs that are associated with picking or pulling either before or after, the feelings, the emotions, the urges, what's the emotional driver of the pulling, Motor, just the motor, the motor situation. When I sit in a certain place, when I lean back and relax, my hand automatically goes to my head. Um, when I am in certain other types of, 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 of places or things, that this is, this is what happens. Um, and then place, because the environmental factors are critical. As I said before, a lot of kids, a lot of patients pull when they go to bed at night. Others, it's really common for kids to come home from school, they want to let down, you know, they've been stressed all day, maybe related to pulling, maybe related to other factors. They sit down and watch TV, you know, they're just, they're kind of like this and they're leaning on their hand. And before you know it, an hour goes by and their hair is all over the place. So we want to understand the situations or objects within their environments. And with each one of these modalities, we identify the trigger and then we come up with a specific intervention. So itchy arms that makes me want to want to pick or pull. So anti-itch cream, cognitive. Um, you know, well if I if I wear my certain certain shirt, then I'm not going to pull or I'm not going to pick or I'm going to really not pick or pull today. Um, and we put notes around or we do cognitive cognitive you know interventions. Feeling distressed or annoyed. Again, we're going to teach we're going to teach regulatory strategies like breathing, for example, motor. You know, if I'm if I'm sitting like this, if I my you can't see if my arms are folded, whatever it might be. Um, if I'm on my phone, phone is the big thing. You know, you just 
pulling and picking on your phone or on the laptop, then I need to put gloves on when I'm in certain situations. I need to wear an elbow brace. I need to wear the heavy necklace in places. When my hands are empty, that's when I go like this. So I need to keep my hands busy at all times. Um, it's more sophisticated than that, but it's actually quite a simple treatment. And what we do with kids is we may develop one of these for each room in the house. So we want to, what are the different triggers for these different situations at different times of day and different places? And then you can see what we actually will do is we'll create little baskets for the patients. So when I walk in the door and I put down my keys, that's my cue to start picking. I had a patient that that's exactly what she did because I'm, because I'm anxious and I'm tired and you know it's whatever. I've been outside and my hair's all messed up. So there's a basket, right? When she walks in the door, there's a, she puts her keys down in this basket. She takes out itch cream. She takes out a koosh ball, she takes out a mint, and she takes out some lavender oil. And she just, every one of these modalities is gonna do this. In the bathroom, there's something different. In the bathroom, she either covers the mirror or she has signs on the mirror that say, that say, you know, watch it, don't pick, three breaths. Or there's a timer in the bathroom. She goes in, she gets 15 seconds to look in the mirror to comb her hair. There are brushes everywhere, so she can brush her hair instead of picking. For kids, we might have like different kinds of textured cloth that they can rub on themselves if they want that sensation. Little rewards everywhere um, for them to do and bracelets and just, and literally every room where the person picks or every setting, there's the basket to address each of these, each of these needs. This is a very personalized approach. And then ERP, so exposure plus response prevention, and that can address the sensory issues. And we're just going to trigger the urge to pull or pick, and the kids are going to sit with it um, in the same way that we would that we would do um, for OCD. You know, on, we're on a hierarchy. Then we might even have give them a hair or something like a hair to play with or to pull, and to practice this in situations. So they may actually just put their hand up like this once they're more advanced and feel maybe tug, feel the urge, and just learn how to try to resist um, this, this uh, you know, this urge to pull. Um, ACT enhanced a a HRT. So again, when we're doing these treatments and there's a manual here, there was a study done by Doug Woods, who some of you may know looking at this, where we're combining HRT with more of goal setting and, and acceptance of urges. There was another study by Nancy Cuthin that, that looked at HRT um, enhanced with dialectical behavior therapy. Again, for adults, oftentimes you're gonna need one of these enhancements. Just doing HRT by itself probably isn't enough in most cases. So how do we put this together? So when we're thinking about the different pulling patterns, the subtypes, and um, just you know the very basic subtypes of intentional versus emotional pulling. For treatment of intentional pulling, we wanna increase awareness right, and disrupt the motor sequence. And if somebody's just pulling and pulling and pulling, um, that might be habit reversal and functional analysis. Where are these areas where you feel this urge to pull, where you feel the triggering? So HRT, functional analysis and stimulus control. And again, because pulling and picking can be gratifying, we really need to come up with a pretty strong reward system and um, really very careful stimulus control to make the pulling more difficult, to outweigh the positives, create enough negatives associated with the pullings in terms of making it more difficult or creating more cognitive awareness of this to make it more difficult to, to pull. The emotional pulling, we probably want to address the underlying emotional factors. So in these cases, we're going to, we're going to want to add CBT for anxiety and depression, maybe a DBT or ACT to address the experiential avoidance. And most, most since intentional and emotional pulling occur in most people, most people do both they just do differently, emotional in some settings and intentional in others. Oftentimes it's gonna be a combination. So in certain situations or settings, it may be more HRT and others, it may be maybe different intervention. Um, we just have a minute left, but I wanna talk very briefly about inhibitory control. And we know that inhibitory control, and this is one of the BPMI studies that, that we're, is currently being written, written up. We know that response, response inhibition or, or impulsivity is a big issue in TRIC. So we looked at different types of, of, of impulsivity in people with trick and skin picking. We found that poor inhibitory control, difficulty inhibiting responses, predicted both trick and skin picking severity. However, skin picking and trick severity were predicted by different indicators. 
And what we found was that trick severity and impairment was predicted by, by more intentional impulsiveness or poorer focus and greater motor impulsivity. So these were people that were picking less likely to pick. Um, the impulsivity here was, was really characterizing more, less, less ability to really recognize when they're pulling, kind of doing it maybe more out of conscious, out of um, out of consciousness. Again, which would argue more for the HRT approach. And the skin pickers on average were characterized by more cognitive impulsiveness. They had difficulty future planning. In other words, and, and a way you think about cognitive impulsiveness is I'm gonna do something now um, because, it, because, I, I, because it feels good, even though it may have negative consequences in the future. That's kind of a definition of impulsiveness, as well as avoidance of aversive experiences. So the, the skin pickers are more likely, and we saw this from our, our other three subtypes, to really engage in picking to reduce the impact of negative aversive experiences. They have difficulty tolerating um, difficult experiences internally or externally, and they're more likely to, to pick or pull to manage these. The pullers, again, you saw the largest group were those that really just kind of pull maybe less with less focus on, on why they're pulling. So again, here, I think this really reinforces the idea of for trick or for more, um, more impulsive pulling, focusing really on urge awareness and behavioral strategies. And for skin picking or more of the emotional pulling, we really want to look at exposure therapy to increase tolerance, as well as CBT and DBT and maybe goal-directed interventions. We also found that, um, that mood disorder, depression was a significant predictor of overall disability. So we have to screen for depression and anxiety in all of our patients. Um, I've alluded to pharmacologic treatments, so I'm not gonna go into them other than um, there's been a little bit of work maybe with some cannabinoid agonists, maybe possibly more research is needed. And then naltrexone, which is an opioid ag agonist, actually in one small study suggested that um, girl, females with a family history of alcohol addiction in, in, a, in a parent responded better to this opioid antagonist, which has been used in addiction. So there may be a subtype of pickers and pullers, as I said, that might be more related to addiction, perhaps even genetically or biologically. And we might want to look at treatments from that realm um, in these individuals. So um, the other th final thing is working with hair and skin care professionals. And we've done a lot of work with them and um, creating networks because they're the ones that oftentimes first see these symptoms. So we need to educate our hair and skin care professionals um, in terms of what to look for and how to recognize and then to appropriately refer. So thank you. I want to acknowledge um, uh, Emily Ricketts, Tara Paris, and Suzanne Mouton Odom for sharing some of their slides with me and the BPI, my group, my group at UCLA. And I also want to put in a pitch for the UCLA Cares Center, which is a uh, center for anxiety prevention, education and prevention. And again, there's a QR code here. We have a lot of information, including about uh, anxiety, OCD, tick, and BFRBs, great resources for parents and kids and teachers. So I'm gonna stop here. I, I think we don't have a lot of time for questions. I'm willing to stay on a little bit late. Um, and I, and I, I do appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to me. Wonderful. Th thank you, Dr. Piacentini. I, I'm gonna just launch the, um, um, the post-webinar evaluation, but I, I can see there is a question in chat there. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, about baby trick? Yeah. Yeah, we, oh, we definitely want to intervene if we can. But, um, you know, again, I assume you all are pretty familiar with, with Tourette's and, you know, the parenting piece. We, we want to teach the parents how to create a Tourette neutral environment. We want to teach parents how to create a trick and picking neutral environment. We don't want parents to overreact. We don't want parents to freak out. We um, really want to um, have parents typically gently redirect the babies or the kids when they're doing this without any sense of shame or anger. Um, oftentimes giving the, the, the babies or kids toys or other things to, to do instead. Um, and uh, even in some cases, stimulus control might be giving little gloves to the kids. Um, right now, we have a five-year-old that we've, she's wearing big necklace, pearl necklace that she plays with instead of picking. Um, she's getting some princess gloves. So definitely we wanna use behavioral strategies in that sense. There are other questions? I believe there is another one there. How can we assess for oh, subtypes? Yeah. 
a very careful, um, I think a very careful assessment when you're doing um, um, assessing these individuals that coming in, you're going to want to ask about the different, there, there are a lot of measures. So there's a measure um, called the MIST, which is, um, and the MIDAS, which are the two measures that we use to look at these subtypes, the emotional versus intentional, which I think is important. Again, understanding that most people do both. Um, we also want to um, assess anxiety, depression, other kind of psychiatric comorbidities. Um, I like emotional regulation or distress tolerance. Again, there's some measures in this battery. We want to look at sensory factors. We want to look at, um, you know, just really a very careful functional evaluation of what's going on. Is the behavior rewarding? What's rewarding about it? Is it a, a set, are you, are you doing these behaviors? What, what are the gains? You know, what are, what are the antecedents to this, the triggers, and what are the consequences, good and bad? And I think that's really, really important here um, from a behavioral approach and also from a broader psychiatric evaluation.